What do you do when you seem to get really sad only during a certain season of the year? My name is Dr. Rowe, and this is Life Jack, the Resilience Podcast. Life Jack is when an unfortunate or unplanned event happens to Jack with your life. My guest for this week, Dan Granger, is a former special education and childhood development teacher whose journey is a testament to the power of resilience. Having faced childhood depression and seasonal affective depression, Dan turned his personal struggles into a mission to uplift others. His book, why is Sam so sad? Seasonal affective disorder and depression from a child's perspective is available on Amazon. His experiences motivated him to write a book aimed at children and adults with the goal of fostering resilience in those facing similar challenges. Dan believes that even the smallest achievements deserve recognition and that affirmations can be a powerful tool and building confidence and resilience, especially in children. Listen in as he shares insights on resilience and how he continues to make a difference through writing and teaching. Sometimes life gives us lemons. Sometimes it gives us lemonade. Other times it gives us something entirely out of left field that makes us say, W-T-F. But no matter what obstacles come, there is most often a way out on the other side, and we are once again victorious. My name is Dr. Rowe, and you are listening to my podcast about resilience. Every guest shares a tragedy to triumph story to give listeners like you the inspiration to push through every single day. Listen now as my next guest shares how they were life jacked. Hi, Dan. Welcome. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. How are you? I'm great. Wow, that is a heck of an introduction. <laughs> I don't know if I can live up to all of that, but wow, we'll try. <laughs> I believe that you will be just fine. So would you mind telling the listeners just a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, my name is Dan Granger. I grew up in Wisconsin, and I've had seasonal affective disorder. I've also had a couple other things that have changed, shaped me too. I not only was a special ed teacher, but I is what I I was diagnosed as a special ed individual, and I also had Jacksonian epilepsy, which is epilepsy that leads around the around puberty. And surprisingly, and at one point I was actually, my mom believed that I was born in a seizure because I didn't make any noise when I came out of the womb. The doctor held me and then put me on a cold table and I screamed and then he lifted me up and I peed on him. He's like, okay, he's fine. <laughs> so yeah, I've had, I've, had, I've had some ups and downs and some challenges in life. So, but yeah, with as far as seasonal affective disorder, it's definitely something that comes and goes, and my family's aware of it, and friends of mine are aware of it, and it it definitely has it definitely has changes to those around you. You may even push people away at times too, but I'll get into that later. So it's interesting that the disability or the diagnosis of seasonal affective depression is actually can turn can be turned into an acronym which is SAD spelled S A D and as you said you were affected with seasonal affective depression can you share exactly what that is and how it affected you in your childhood seasonal affective disorder is the term that i'm most familiar with is a kind of depression that only comes out during part of the season. It's not something that stays with you the whole time. So there are some people that have depression and their depression is a whole year long. Well, season affective disorder is only during certain parts of the season. For the winter, 
for the winter seasonal affective disorder, or SAD, it's 90% of the population suffer from that, and 10% suffer from the summer seasonal affective disorder. So what it is, is during that time, people either get, people get depressed during that time. As far as the winter is concerned, you can kind of think about it like a bear hibernating. They oversleep, they overeat, and they binge on comfort foods. And then when summer comes around, that bear now looks at themselves and like, oh my gosh, what did I do to my body? What did I do to, and then they get fr frustrated. But the key is really just that they're overeating and oversleeping. And then as far as seasonal affective disorder for summer, the 10%, they deal with a lot of anxiety that, and, they're, and insomnia as opposed to the bear. So they don't get as much sleep. And that happens, and as far as the winter is concerned, the peaks are, what, what was it, January to February. I'm guessing it's probably because during the winter, you kind of look forward to Christmas, and then after Christmas and New Year's is over, then you just kind of deal with the rest of the winter itself. Wow, and it's so interesting because, you know, I'm not saying that I am affected with seasonal affective depression, but I'm a summer girl, maybe because I was born in August. <laughs> so I love the summer. Oh, there you go. I love, yeah, I love anything sun. I love anything beach. And I can tell you, I cannot stand the cold. I, I can't. I mean, I, I, you know, go through it. And yeah, Christmas is exciting. But, you know, it's interesting that you say that, that sometimes there, there are, are certain seasons that affect people. And like you said, they overeat or they're depressed. And, and it does seem like winter, whenever you see winter, aside from talking about a holiday, <laughs> it, it seems like winter the stories are always dismal and dark and, you know, void of happiness. <laughs> you know, it's just, that's interesting. Hmm. Hmm. I will definitely so agree with that. That's pretty much my childhood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, so for you, how did SAD or SAD or seasonal affective depression, how did it affect you specifically? So one of the things I talk about, and I have actually a picture in my book, and I actually talk about it, I didn't like Christmas. I didn't like, I mean, I liked the activities during that, but because of having the, having the time off and as a special ed individual, your your days are under complete routine and you're so used to schedule where not necessarily a regular a regular individual would have that. But for but for individuals that are special ed, we in order to keep in order to keep order, we just had a set schedule and we knew what we were gonna do and that the anxiety down, kept the violence down, things like that. As long as you have the best thing for you know children in general is and so during Christmas break you don't have a schedule. So as fun as it is, is excuse me, as fun as it is to you know sleep in and then stay up late, that part kind of goes away. For me, the worst part about my when seasonal affective disorder kicks in for me is negative thoughts, and negative thoughts can be pushed away when you're active. However, when you go to bed, there's no activity anymore. And so for me, my negative thoughts just went over and over and over and over again, and they just ruminated. So I became a really good reader because I tried to read and then put good thoughts in my head, and then I would thought about my characters and what are they doing and whatever. But otherwise, if my negative thoughts were busy, you know, and I had a bad night, I could easily, and it didn't matter what age at all, I could, I could be up to like, you know, I can try to go to bed at 10 or try to go to bed at 9, and I would still be up to like 1 or 3 or, you know, until my finally, my, my body just exhausted. And then soon after that, eh, the alarm goes off and you're more tired than you were before. Wow. Now, how do you feel that like your experiences shape your perspective on resilience? So that's going to be a combination of all three. The seasonal affective disorder, 
growing up a special ed individual, having draconian epilepsy. Like I said, from birth, I had a seizure. And seizures are when the body shakes uncontrollably. If you've ever seen somebody go through it, you don't want to see it again. And, but you can only imagine that with a little child. And my mom trying to get me the right medication within like a two or three months, like two or three years. And we went to 23 medications. Some made me hyper, some made me tired, some made me completely lethargic. And some just, it's just, it was just kind of crazy. So there's two kind of seizures. There's the one where you kind of know, you know, you don't, you're just not there. Your 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 eyes may be looking, but your mind's gone at that point in time. And I would zone out a lot. It looked like I was daydreaming, but I wasn't. And then, of course, there's the grand mall and different things like that. So there's that. There's special ed individual. There's a special ed individual which is definitely a part of me. And then there's, of course, the sadness. And as far as resilience, what I've always tried to do is try to find people that are in the same boat as me. So for as far as, far as like special ed, you know, I'm dyslexic and I deal with dyscalculia. So dyslexic is dealing with lack, dealing with trouble with words. This Calcula is dealing with numbers, which is math. And then I had trouble with order of operations. So you can imagine word problems were a killer. That being said, I looked for, I've always looked for who has the same problem I do. And as far as special ed or dyslexia is concerned, there's a lot of people. Tom Cruise had two different, yeah, he had two different uh, two different scripts. One was like the words that he had to say, and then one were the words that everybody had to say, and then there's other times that you know, and, and he listened to it and listened to it and listened to it because he couldn't necessarily read. I remember reading about a wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers. He was talking about how he didn't, you know, learn to read until he was, you know, until later as an adult or or, or later in high school. So as far as resilience, it's just been something I've always had to do and I've tried to, you know, meet goals because I just, it's just in me, I guess you can say. And, and I want to bring that to other people. And as far as being a teacher of special ed, I got that chance to bring that to many kids who are dealing with special ed who deal with nobody understands what I'm going through. And when a special ed teacher comes, they deal with the same kind of kid. You have this bond that this kid is, oh, really? You've gone through the same thing? Oh, my God. Okay. Okay, I'll listen to you. You know, where sometimes you're not, you're not necessarily listening to it, especially as a son. But anyway, that's, that's a different story. I think that it's incredibly awesome that, and I guess it just shows how resilient you are because most people – who struggle with a learning disability, they don't think about doing something like a- academic as writing. <laughs> you know, that's not something that they think about. And so what motivated you to transition from teaching to writing? Well, that's as far as when I be- decided when to write this book, I've always been, I've always had like writing here and there to keep me busy when I was younger, because an active, an active imagination that put some things down. And at one point I was up for a, I think it was fifth grade, I was up for a, one of my special ed teachers took one of my stories and she nominated me to be in this, to be in a, an award for the school. I lost to a friend of mine, but I mean, and I was frustrated as a kid. I was like, oh man, you know, I didn't get it. But, you know, my teacher was able to explain it, you know, like, but you did this part and you got this part. Maybe you didn't win, but you still have a great story. What motivated me to write this? Well, during COVID, I went through a really By that, I mean, I wanted to leave this world. I worked at a place that I'm not, that I didn't like in the factory. And it was all artificial lighting. 
and I looked at a, I worked 14 hours a day, seven days a week. During these two years, during COVID, when we first started, we needed to get as many, we were just crazy busy. And I didn't really talk to that many people and my depression just kicked in because I was, I didn't have a purpose. I didn't have a purpose at all. I didn't like the job I was in, but I left teaching before that and I didn't really know what I was supposed to do. What I did is I left Arizona and then came back to Wisconsin, but there wasn't many jobs available during the during COVID. So there wasn't really teacher jobs available because everybody was everybody was quarantined at the time. So there wasn't any in not having my my chosen, you know, my chosen field. I knew I wanted to be a teacher when I was in second grade. So, and I've always had the ability to talk to people and communicate with them and solve problems and and things like that. And just the way that I was always able to communicate with people, teachers would always have me explain something. And that's always been my my go-to part. You know, every boss has always had me train somebody and every job I've ever had. And so for me, it's, I just, have an, I have a knack to communicate with people and I do it a very understanding way. And I've never had anybody frustrated by anything that I've, I've said or tried to communicate with them. And I've seen other people that don't have that ability. And as a teacher, you just look at them, you're like, yeah, you probably shouldn't have done it. Well, so it's, it's, it's hard to go from teaching to writing. It, just, it, it was a cathartic thing that I created all of this this book, and this I was it was a catalyst. I was called to do this book. I was actually writing another book and put it on hold so I could this book because my body needed to have this book written, and I needed to get this out because otherwise I was I didn't have a purpose. The other purpose I had that I went through during this time was I went through a journey to help my friend get a kidney. So I was going to talk to Not only was I writing a book, but I was going to secretly going to hospital. They didn't even know because I didn't want them to know. But my best friend, who I've known since he knew they kid me, and I went on a journey. My thought was, I'm not going to need it where I'm going. Wow. Do you believe? that writing somehow serves as a tool for your own healing? Totally. It totally did. Not only did it give me a purpose, but I was able to explain things that I hadn't been able to before. And just, of course, writing things down, as soon as you get it out of your, out of your mind, you're better off. Like that's 100% has always been the thing. If there's something in your head and you can't get it out of your head, you write it down, usually it's done and over with. But through this journey, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot from either researching per each interview or researching for the book itself or researching because I wanted to. But yeah, I created this book and went through the whole process of making the book and talking to people. And the amazing thing was that I told a friend of mine at work, hey, I want to write a book. I'm, I'm working on write a book. And surprisingly, he had a friend. I'm going to write touch with you. I'm like, okay. So she gave me the phone number. And I ended up with a, she, she told me who to go to. I, I looked online and made the connection. And so I thought, I thought I went with the same company she did. But by the time it was over, I realized I had somebody totally different, but the publishing, the com- company I got was Christian Faith Publishing, and I think it would have, might have been some different word like Publishing Faith, or I don't know what it was, but yeah, it was surprising. So it was just kind of like, wait a minute, I got off the phone and whoop, I went to the wrong company. But I, w- I was happy with the company, and I still am happy with the company. Love that. Now, I, love, I absolutely love that you're your mission is to help others who suffer as you did because 
of course, this is the first time I have ever heard of seasonal affective depression disorder. And I, I honestly did not know it existed. And I'm sure there are many people, children, adults who are dealing with it. So I think it's awesome that you seeing people who suffer from it to bring light to this and awareness. And so what are some of the key messages you hope that readers take away from your book? Well, first of all, I just want to explain when seasonal affective disorder came into play. Norman E. Rosenthal and his colleague coined the term seasonal affective disorder in 1985. Since then, he's had a bunch of different books, including I think he's up to 14 books is as far as that is concerned. But yeah, life has an effect with lack of certain kind of hormones, serotonin and melatonin. Melatonin is the one that makes you sleepy. The, the body, the biological clock is driven by when to sleep. And so the circadian rhythm, which is the biological clock, tells the body it takes in the amount of light that's around through the eyes. And the eyes are looking at that and they're like, okay, well, there's less light. So I'm guessing I'm going to put more melatonin and make me sleepy so that could be if you can think about it think about like vegas vegas the lights are completely bright so you never know when you're supposed to sleep or not that's why people could stay up forever and then think about like a child or at a, at a movie or a or a child in in a school and they're watching a movie and they turn on the lights, and sometimes you'll see the kids actually fall asleep well, that's because there's less light and the body said, oh, I guess it's time to sleep. And that's why, you know, same things at movie theaters, that some adults or some kids get sleepy because there's no light or it's not enough light to, you know, keep you up. And like I said, as far as the serotonin, that's just the body boosting and the energy. And so that regulates the circadian rhythm. And circadian rhythm is Latin for about the day. So Diem, we all know, is day from seed to day. Definitely resilient. You definitely, my, my thing that I really want people to know is that sometimes the kids push their family and friends away. And I think with this book, by reading this book, you understand why you are pushed away. So, you know, my good friends know that I'm going to push them away during, during winter time. And it's just, this is, you know, and this just doesn't affect your friends and family. It affects like your intimate, your, you know, your intimate relationships too. As long as they know, then they're going to be pushed away. But otherwise, if they don't know, it can cause a fight. Like why, what's going on? Like, do, you know, do I trust this person? Are they cheating on me? What's going on? Why are they pushed away? Why are they, why are they you know, things like that. And then, then if you don't know, the mind is just going to go into wondering why this person is pushing you away. The other thing is that it's a very, very lonely, lonely, depression is a very lonely disease. And the frustration is that, you know, if you see somebody walking with that, you know why they're hurt. But as far as depression, it's not something that people talk about, especially guys, because we don't you know, we're not supposed to show weaknesses. And that's where I believe it's underdiagnosed. It has three fourths of, yeah, three out of four girls more, more so than boys. And so it's just something that, it's just something that, you know, needs to be known. And, and the thing about it is, is that when I wrote this book, I wrote it for people to understand what's going on. And people that I know have read this book. And one of my best friends said, he read the book and he said, I feel I know you better. And I mean, what a compliment that was. No, that's great. Now, you're, the main character of your book is named Sam, right? There's, this, there's a Correct. kid and his name is mm -hmm. and Sam has a gratitude list. So can you talk about the importance of having a gratitude list? First of all, what is a gratitude list for the listeners who don't know? And then why should we 
have a gratitude list. If you are practicing gratitude at the time you are being grateful, you cannot be angry, sad, or fearful at that time. You just can't, according to Tony Robbins. And, so I know, I'm like, ooh, ooh. and after I did that, and after I started being grateful, I, you know, would look more for positive things and write these grateful things down. Where when you're thinking negative all the time, you force yourself to look at positive. My mom, when I was growing up, she, after you, she would pick me up and I would have to tell her one good thing that happened before I started on all the news. She was, she was serious. She, she turned the car off until we actually, until I actually said it. My friends would jump in like, yeah, this is what Dan did. And then she'd look at me. She's like, well, that's true. I didn't ask about what your friend did. I asked about you. I'm like, oh, man. So you want to focus on the positive as much as possible. So grateful, your gratitude is being grateful for things that either happen to you or you, basically you being grateful for that which you've received or that you, which you can give. It's better thing to give than to receive. It's that kind of thing. And the other thing is there's actually a helper's high. So not only there's a runner's high, but you get, an endor- you get the endorphins from helping somebody else. The actual, the same exact kind of things that would go through your body, the endorphins kick in and you're actually able to help somebody. You feel good. You feel energetic. And, and obviously after it's over, you feel excited and thank you, you know, that you had this opportunity to be grateful. So some of the things that you can be grateful for are as a, as a child, think about if you're late and you're late and you make all green lights and then you're, you, you get to school on time, or you did well on a test. You know, you had enough time to study, and you are grateful that you did well, you know, on your grades, and then you can, or think about maybe, you know, like Friday night for us was always pizza night. Also in Wisconsin, in the Midwest, they had fish fries, so I'd be grateful it's Friday, you know. We made a, yeah, I made it to Friday, I made it to pizza day or things like that. So just being grateful, being thankful for what you have. We, especially nowadays, I don't think we're as grateful as what we used to be. And we need to get back to that. We need to be thankful for what we have. It's really hard nowadays because of the way we are comparing everybody, comparing everybody to ourselves, you know, especially with social media and this person has this and this person has that. But what do you have? What can you bring to the table? And if you're grateful, like I said, you can't be angry, you can't be fearful, and you can't be sad at that time because you're grateful. It, the body, the mind just won't allow that to happen. So as somebody who isn't thinking negative thoughts and thinking bad about themselves, I wrote down a grateful list. And Sam has one too. And that's actually on, he has a grateful list on my webpage about 10 things that he's done people. The one thing that he's really happy for is when he wakes up and he sees the sun because he, he, he feels the warm rays and he's happy that he's there as opposed to when it's winter or it's dark and the depression kicks in more. Now, you're an educator. I'm an educator. And I know you are aware of bullying happening in schools and a lot of children are afflicted by bullying and not everybody, not all children let someone know that they are a victim of being bullied. So how do we foster resilience in children and, you know, and whether they're being bullied or not? And I know that you've talked about the importance of affirmation, you know, and just making children feel good about themselves, I guess, and that kind of helps foster self-confidence as well. But what are, why is it important to, you know, give, give, give children affirmations, do you think? And then, like, what are some examples of affirmations educators and parents can say to children? Sure. So I myself listen to a lot of guided meditation, and I also listen to affirmations here and there. 
as far as the affirmations, their I am statements. And as soon as you use an I am statement, you look, you basically say positive things about you. As soon as you do the same thing as calling your name. And so, you know, I am, I am a good writer. And the, I wouldn't think that writing. I am good at I am you twist your body thinking the negative stuff. And in thinking and in, in doing that, you're if you do it enough, it helps. And you 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 don't have to deal you don't have to deal with the negative thoughts as much. So I thought some I saw some there's neg- there's a there's a web or yeah, there's a YouTube called Psych to Go. So it's psych, the number two, G-O, and that's a good website it, for children. It shows a cartoon version of whatever is going, whatever is being introduced or, or discussed. But yeah, they, they talk about an individual who has, who has a business and he said, I am not successful. And you see him not successful. And then he says, I am successful. And you see where his business went from making backpacks to making other things that, you know, making bags that, bags that roll, like those rolling backpacks and things like that. And that, you know, happens within two years or whatever, according to this story. But the more positive things you can say about yourself, the more positive your mind will believe it because you have to tell your mind what to believe. Heard by others, and I am, and I have inspiration to others, courageously pursuing my dreams. I take steps towards my goals each and every day. Found those ones. Jason Stevenson. Listen to listen to these tonight because they talk about the last thing you want to see at night is something negative. So if you bombard yourself with positive things at night, when your mind is thinking things through between when you go to sleep and when you wake, your mind, your mind filters things and tries to make the better of your life with what it was given at that time. So therefore you try to inspire and try to explain, you know, try to do as many positive things you possibly can. Like I said, if you go negative, then you're going to wake up negative. But if you go positive and you think happy thoughts. Now, I know that you said earlier that depression is a solo state, that people who are depressed you oftentimes are very much alone. And it's interesting because it seems like resilience is, a solo journey, or at least people try to display it as a solo journey, you know, like pick yourself up and you see, when you see resilience being depicted, it's usually someone by themselves. (laughs) But I'm thinking that, you know, maybe resilience doesn't have to be something that happens, you know, alone that you do as a solo activity. Because like you said, you know, you get to talk to people and you're encouraging children to talk to people and be open. So how important is community support in building resilience, especially for children? As far as community, I don't know. Basically what it is is you need to provide obstacles for your kids. I saw something on a YouTube where a man walks across the, and this child, little infant, and he's walking across a bridge or, or to a bridge and then to get to a one season of Sydney. And he walks over. And he must have set this thing up. And it was kind of like this, this web of rubber bands or something. And the child had to figure out how to get past the rubber bands. So the dad just used his two feet, walked over, sat at the bench. And the, kid, and the kid's like, oh, my gosh. You know, he's keep crying. And then the dad came because he saw he was tangled, walked over, grabbed the kid, put him back, you know, got him untangled put him back a couple more feet and the kid was figured it out. He pushed down the rubber bands and he walked across and then he ran over to his dad and his dad was so excited. But at the first time you see this, you're just like, Oh my gosh, what did that guy just 
Ew, like how, how horrible is he? He's leaving his kid. And you see him sit down when he went over. He sat down at the bench and watched this kid. So he didn't walk away from them. But I see that and just, I, that guy, and they talked about it on the YouTube, he created this obstacle and created resilience. So what I do is I always try to think of, as far as resilience, I need to keep going because there's people that are worse shaped than me. So Shakespeare once said, I once cried because I had no shoes. Then I saw a man with no legs and I stopped crying. The other thing is when you are dealing with depression, depression is a very, very small, narrow-minded view. And if you look at the world in a narrow-minded view, you're not going to get very far. You know, basically like, you know, you're closed up in a closet or whatever. Now, if you think about a kid and being depressed and you want to get as far away from, you know, you just want to experience them. And as a kid, well, you can either walk when you're younger, you can either walk from your house or then you get older, you can bike and you can bike from, you know, your friend's house or different towns. And then when you get a car, it's even better. You can go, to different cities or even countries. And so when you see the world as a bigger place than where you actually are, where you are, it's not, it's doable. You know, it's the same thing as, you know, my boyfriend or my girlfriend just broke up. So life, life is horrible. Well, there's plenty of fish in the sea. Well, that's true. There is plenty of fish in the sea and there's a big, big world. And then of course you talk about how young somebody is or how old they are. And, that's the other thing. There's so much of the world and there's so much time that you have that you just have to remember that, you know, this is a small amount of time the person that you have to deal with. And sooner, you know, the day is going to be, sometimes I've, you know, I've given up and there was a day that, you know, yeah, this just isn't my day and I'll go to bed early and hopes that, you know, the next day will be better and, and usually is. But yeah, so as far as resilience, you just have to overcome obstacles. And so how we can put obstacles into the community, you know, how, how community members can provide obstacles. There's tons of different groups that kids can join. And I mean, there's tons of obstacles that you have and challenges that you have to face by within different groups. You know, any person in sports would tell you that. Any person that as hikes or bikes or any kind of activity that they have, they they've they've had to pursue or they've had they've had to have perseverance in order to get to where they want to be. You know, at some point I'd love to run a half marathon. I don't know if that'll ever happen, but that would be something that I would have to work towards and then pursue and really get through. And same thing with, you know, if you think about like kids riding a bike, well if I was able to do it then, and I was able to give you the, that challenge, well, I can obviously get through the next. You just have to, the problem, you know, when you think narrow-minded, you don't think of what you've all done. As far as what you've all done, well, you know, you've learned to ride a bike, you've learned to ride a, you know, drive a car, you've learned to do this, you've learned all kinds of academics, things like that. And so what, if you can do that then, why can't you do it now? You know, and we need to have more people that provide those obstacles and those challenges for individuals. So, Dan, what advice would you give to someone struggling with their own mental health challenges, whether it be sad disorder or anything else? Basically, same thing I already just said is that you need to stop thinking narrow minded. And you need to, like, when I was in college, the list, like, like I told you before about Tom Cruise, the list of people that have that were supplied and have succeeded in life. I think I still maybe even have it. And I had a list of different people and I'd look at it every day. It would be on you know, when I woke up, I'd look at it and remember, okay, yeah, you know, was a tough day or you know, that's whatever. It might have been created it in high school. But yeah, you need to have role models to look at people that have 
most people that have succeeded, you need to think and you need to learn from them. What was it that made them succeed? What can you take? What can you piggyback on their idea and go from there? My mom found out that when I was, she was, you know, they were saying, Dan has trouble reading, Dan does this. You know, and it's something that Spotlight is, and even SAD itself too, is something that's passed on through the genes. So there are, there are individuals that have dealt with the same kind of thing. You need to make sure that you find those individuals and with them and you know, have, have them help you. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's the reason why I became a teacher because I wanted others to know that it's possible to succeed. In fact, I wasn't, I graduated after I had already been kicked out because I, my, my grades were horrible. I had a 1.8 and I went to a college and I had to take a dyslexic remediation course. If I didn't take the course, I couldn't get in. But that was part of the that was part of the contract that I could do college with a one point eight. I left college with a three point eight. So I just I've always tried to do my best and try to succeed and things like that. So I I know for myself that I've, and I'm sure for others, they just have to figure out what it is that they can do and, and just challenge themselves. You were able to complete this and you were able to succeed at this. So that's what I'd say as far as mental health challenges is that don't let it beat you. I even say that in my book. I say when he's, when Sam's hearing the negative thoughts, I say that, you know, I need to remember, or Sam says, I need to remember that it's not the sad, it's not me talking, it's the sad talking. And so if you can take these negative thoughts and say that they're not the same kind of thing, that they're not you, but the, but the problem itself or the, or the issue, the mental, the mental challenge itself, then you can distance yourself from it. And once you distance yourself from it, and it's not a part of you, you can fight it a little bit better. Yeah, I, I really would hope that people would take things from, you know, take that Sam is resilient and he's gone through a lot from the book. And, and in order to keep coming, you know, and all the stuff he's done and, and that he wants other people to know that he's gone through it, but not only he's gone through it, he's trying to teach others how to go through it. Thank you for joining me, Dan. I really appreciate you. I am sure your insights and experiences have resonated with my listeners and inspired them on their own journeys of resilience. Please take the time to let everyone know how they can get a copy of your book, Why is Sam So Sad? Seasonal Affective Disorder and Depression from a Child's Perspective. Sure, you can go on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or any place that has has books. You can easily go to see my website, Dan D A N dash the minus sign Granger dot com, and you can go on my website and see Sam's gratitude list. You can see a bunch of different things about SAD. As far as that, there's also a school tip that teachers can look at that I found online that talk about how to best take care of that as far as teachers are concerned or as far as students are concerned in schools. I think it was 24 pages long. As a teacher, I was really intrigued that I found that and really excited. But yeah, definitely you can check out my, check out anything you want. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. At, yeah, like I said, Amazon and Barnes and Noble Anywhere, anywhere books are sold. <laughs> Any last words of encouragement for the listeners? Yes, I was hoping you'd say that. So every time I sign a book, I always leave, I always write my, obviously I write my signature, but I say, Sam and I 
are wishing you much happiness as you create your own list of gratitude. All the best, Dan Granger. Wow, that's awesome. Well, Dan, I wish you and your family nothing but blessings and abundance. Thank you for being a guest. Please take care. It's been a complete pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. You've reached the end of another episode of Life Jacked, the Resilience Podcast. Connect with me at www.lifejackedpodcast.com. Don't forget to sign up to the blog so you won't miss any events or episodes. And every now and then I'll give away free materials from my guests or from me. Remember to live, laugh, love, learn, and then repeat. See you in the next episode.